Well, welcome back everybody. As you can see, we got some drywall tape to repair today. We had a leak in the roof, came down into the seam, delaminated the tape, and we've got to put this whole thing back to its original condition. So I'm going to take you step by step through my process for getting this done. And right now, before we even get started, I'm going to take you through my drywall repair kit so you know how to put your kit together so you can take it in to one job, set everything up, get the job done, put the kit back together, and always have everything you need in one place. So let's go look at the kit. All right, guys, right here we have my medium patch kit. Now, the purpose of this kit is to have everything I need all in one kit. This includes tools and materials all in one kit so that I can grab this from the van, go into the house, get the job done without five more trips back to the van to find all my stuff. Instead, I can go in, get the job done, put the kit back together, take it back out to the van. It's ready to go for the next time. And I don't go back and forth to the van wasting a lot of time and looking for tools. I do have it labeled right here as medium patch. That way it's easy to find. So let's go through it and see what I've got inside. Uh, right off the bat, a paintbrush. Now this obviously is used for painting, but I also use it for dusting in terms of dusting off when we have uh, leaks and you have to repair from a leak, you're gonna find a lot of powdery skim coat and powdery texture that just got all degraded from getting soaked. And you don't wanna leave that on there. So when you're done taking everything off, you actually, in fact, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna scrub it down with this just to get all the big particles off. And then you're gonna use this to just go ahead and dust it down so that way your new mud, when you stick your new mud on, has something good to adhere to and not a lot of dry powder. This tool here, I actually use for texture, but not all of the time. This tool is only good for certain types of texture. It's not made for texture, but it will get the job done and it fits in the kit. Now, I consider texture to be a completely different subject, a completely different video from patching. Patching is one job, texturing is an entirely different skill, but this, in a pinch, every now and then, maybe half of my jobs, I'm able to get my texture done with this instead of having to bring out my texture kit. Of course, drywall tape. You're gonna need your tape. It doesn't matter if it's paper or mesh, everybody has their opinions, but as long as you got some tape in there, you're gonna be good to go if you know how to use it right. And then we've got our knives. I keep these three on me. I found that these three will get me through basically every single job that I need my knives to get me through. A little bit of caulk, and it doesn't matter what kind of caulk. This happens to be kitchen, bath, and plumbing caulk. But all this is for, in fact, let me show you this. So these are my backer boards. When we're doing a drywall patch where you've got like a fist size hole in the wall and you need to actually replace some drywall there, these are gonna be the backer boards that go behind the drywall to screw the new drywall to. And all I do is when I put these in on the back, I just put a very thin coat of any kind of caulk. And all that's gonna do, I do flatten it down so we don't push this back and end up having our drywall with a gap. I smooth it down nice and thin, and when I screw this on, it's just gonna give it a little bit of extra stability to make sure that it doesn't move around in there. So I keep four of those in the box. Rags, obviously you need rags for a multitude of reasons, but I also keep a couple in here, and I have a couple in my EDC bag. But specifically for this kit, the reason that I have these rags is because when I use my drywall knives here to spread some mud around, I'm always gonna be using hot mud and I don't wanna have buckets of water and sponges and everything else for cleaning. That's one of the reasons I do things with the process that I do them with. But basically, whenever I'm done with this, I'm gonna scrape it off and then I'm gonna use one of these rags to actually clean it off instead of using a whole bunch of water. Next, obviously, you're gonna need some kind of knife. You need knife for just about everything. There's one in my EDC bag. There's usually one on my hip, but there's also one in this case, just in case I need it for cutting the drywall or anything else that I just haven't thought of yet. A Little bit of sandpaper. However, you are going to see when you watch my drywalling videos that the sandpaper itself, I try to do sandless patches as often as I can. But if I do need to sand, it's just gonna be a little bit. So I just keep these two sheets in here just in case. 
Trash bags is for cleanliness, obviously, but I want to have them in the kit because, again, I don't want to run back out to the van to grab a trash bag. And I'm going to hang this off of the ladder that I'm using, or I'm going to put it somewhere convenient so that as soon as I'm done with anything that's trash, it goes straight into this bag. And then finally, now I usually have more of these. I would typically have about five or six of these, but this is my actual hot mud. I use Easy Sand 5. That's my favorite. That's my go to. It's available at Ace Hardware and Home Depot and just about anywhere else you go. Other brands are fine. I don't have an issue with any other brands. This is just what I always find. I do use the 5 Minute. If you're not good at this yet, I don't recommend 5 Minute. I think you should start. I don't think you need to start at 90, but start at a 45 minute mud, work your way to a 20 minute mud, and eventually you'll have your process down and five minute mud will be good. I do put these in Ziploc freezer bags, Ziploc brand freezer bags. In my experience, and I have had this go wrong many times with other brands, in my experience, Ziploc, they're not perfect, but they are the least likely to leak on you. You do not want leaks while you're doing this job. And then finally, at the very bottom of the box, I just keep a nice sheet of half inch drywall. Now, if I know I'm gonna need a bigger piece, that's not gonna be a medium patch, that's gonna be a large patch. And if I might need 5 eighths, I'll ask the tenant if this is gonna be on an exterior wall or an interior wall. If it's exterior, I might stop and pick up some 5 eighths as well. But this is just in here so that when I get to the site and empty this kit out, I can just cut whatever size patch I need out of here. Like I said, I've got my backer boards, I've got everything I need in this kit, beginning to end, to walk into that house. The only thing I'll need is I'll need to use the sink for a little water, or I'll carry a bottle of water in with me. But other than needing a little bit of water, this is everything that you need to do. Those patches all in one kit, take it inside, get the patch done, clean up your mess, go put it right back in the van, all put together so the next time you have a patch, you don't need to go looking for stuff, it's already in your kit. Now, step one is to get all of this off. We got to get everything off because it is extremely important when we go to repair this that our mud bonds to the ceiling above. So the first thing, obviously, is just get the tape out. I go to where the tape stops coming down easily, which is right about here. And I go a little bit out and I just cut right into it. That way I make sure we stop the tape removal after where the delamination has occurred so we don't get little bubbles on the end there. And I'm going to do that at both ends. This end is just about there already, but I'm just going to make a cut a couple inches out and then just pull that stuff out. That one's pretty good shape, so I'm actually going to have to clip it out with a knife here. There we go. Get a little bit more off right there. That looks pretty nice. And then we're just gonna start going. You see this ridge here on either side where our skim coat and our texture stop. You wanna use the corner and get up in there and make sure anything that's loose, that's prone to delamination, that you go ahead and delaminate it now to get it off completely. And we're gonna go all the way down here and do this front to back, top to bottom, once we finish, we're going to go back and do it again. And then after we have everything removed that we can remove with a knife, I'm going to go through here. And of course, we're not ready yet. I'm just showing you. I'm going to go through here after everything's removed with a knife. And I'm going to brush it because a lot of this stuff that has come loose where it's delaminated, a lot of this stuff is now powder. It's very, very, very powdery. And it's not going to allow our new mud to stick here. So when we're done scrape or when we're done scraping everything off with this, we're going to brush this extremely thoroughly until nothing more comes off. And then at the very end, we'll even take a regular paintbrush and we'll just get the last bit of the dust off so we have the best possible chance of our new tape and mud actually bonding to the ceiling up here. See you got your eye on this old cowboy And I can tell you never had one for your own Oh, you never been around one Now you're thinking that you found one Well, it might be kind of fun to take him home You giggle every time that I say yes, ma'am And I get this feeling if I held you tight You'd be seeing his and hers Buckles, boots, and spurs But that's feeling you'll get over, over Cause what you gonna 
do with a cowboy When that old rooster crows at dawn When he's lying there instead of Getting out of bed And putting on his boots and getting gone All right, so we got everything cleaned off end to end We've got all the dust off. I don't see anything else that's gonna chip or delaminate or flake on us. So the next step is gonna be to add some new tape down here. And I use five minute mud and I have a very specific process to make this as fast and efficient as possible without sacrificing any quality. So we're gonna go mix up some five minute mud for this and then I'm gonna show y'all how I put it on. All right, let's go over how we take care of this hot mud. Now I've already mentioned, or at least I think I have, I use five minute mud. This is Easy Sand 5. It's the most likely product to find in my kits. About that much, you know, you can make your kits the different sizes that you want them to be. But all you do is you just open up the bag, pour some water in. You'll figure out over time about how much water you're gonna need based on the amount of powder. You'll just kind of start getting a feel for it. Add a little bit more. Keep feeling around until it feels about right. Let's do one more little touch of water, right about there. And then we're gonna close this bag up, make sure it locks, zips and locks all the way down, nice and tight. And then you can just start squishing it around, just with your hands. And as you can see, guys, there's just zero mess to this. It's basically impossible for you to mess up your tenant's house and get a whole bunch of junk everywhere when you're doing this method. And you don't have to go in and out to the water hose outside. You stay right where you're at. You stay nice and efficient. If you need it to be a really, really good mix with no little pieces still hard in there, you can just kind of roll it like this on the table. Typically it won't be necessary, but you can. And then once you've got all of that done, so you're basically mixed here. So once you get all of that done, all you got to do is pick a corner, get everything out of the corner, boom. Now you can just squeeze this out, just like cake decorating. And this is trash. As soon as you're done, sque obviously you wouldn't squeeze it onto the table, but as soon as you're done squeezing this onto your knife and doing whatever you do, you just throw this whole bag in the trash. All right, we got the five minute mud mixed. Let's get the length for our piece of tape real quick. There's other ways to do this with the tape that are a little bit faster, but this is just how I like to do it here. So we got that tape ready. We've got our mud mixed. And then all we got to do, just like squeezing out some cake topping, is we're just going to get a little bit on here, come down. Now, as I said, if I did remember to say this, we want to mix this mud for these joints pretty thin. We want it as wet as possible because if it's not wet, if this mud isn't wet, it's not gonna soak into the tape like it should. So make sure you mix up some nice wet mud. Maybe mix it a little better than I mixed this, but that's all right. I'm gonna get this joint full. And of course, the reason we want that mud wet is so that it actually bonds with everything instead of just drying out as soon as it hits here. Boy. Luckily, I do have enough in this one. All right, a little more in there. We've got a nice, long, wet patch down here. Just come off to the end. Get your tape started right about there. Get a little more wet mud on top of this. Ooh, we just splattered everywhere. It's a good thing I've got a tarp down. That tape nice and buried up inside there. I think I did mention to y'all before, I am not by any means an expert at drywall or mud. In fact, I would consider myself to be 
barely passable, if that. But it does look like our tape is fully seated. It's nice and wet. I don't see any bubbling going on. I don't see any lifting at the edges. So I am pretty happy with this. Now what I'm gonna do at this point, instead of trying to clean all of this up, all I want is for that tape to bond. So what I'm gonna do at this point is stop for just about five or 10 minutes because we're using five minute mud and this is gonna be set. It's not gonna be hard, it's just gonna be set. And after it's set, I'm gonna come back with a bigger knife and I'm just gonna scrape off all these little ridges that are hanging down. We don't need to sand any of this and we don't need to keep touching this and going back and forth over it, trying to get it perfect, because it's a lot quicker to just let it set and then scrape off the high ridges. They'll come off nice and easy. So one of the ways we keep the sandless is these ridges here. We're not gonna sand these, we're just gonna scrape them lightly. So this is hot mud. It's only been on here about 10 minutes or so. It's all set, but it's not dry and it's not hard yet. And we're just gonna take this and very gently, very, very gently, we're gonna scrape down. And as you can see right here, where we've got some buildup, that's just scraping right off. And that's all we're gonna do on this. We're gonna go all the way down at a super slight angle. Cause right after this is a skim coat. The skim coat's gonna cover up any little ridges and stuff that are left in here. Our only goal is just to get the high points so that they don't mess our skim coat up and cause us to bump and rock around everywhere. If you want, you can kind of come in from the side to get some of the ridges on the very edge. Just don't put a lot of pressure in the middle because you don't want to hit that tape. You don't want to dislodge it or delaminate it again. All we're doing here is getting the ridges off. See, there's a little more there. And we're about to have a nice smooth surface to work with. There we go, no sanding, and I'm pretty satisfied. Right about here, I'm pretty satisfied. Yep, that's below there. That this is gonna be more than flat enough for us to do at least our first skim coat. We'll see if we need two or three. So we've got another batch of hot mud mixed up here. I also made this one relatively thin. The next batch might be a little thicker, but this one's kind of in between the normal consistency you might think you'd want for mud and the really thin mud that we wanna make sure we're putting on that tape so it bonds well. And we're just gonna go ahead and apply another coat. Now, one thing I do wanna to mention to y'all is yes, there are better ways to use your mud, to mix your mud, to get the mud that you need. Uh, I'm a handyman. I am not a professional drywaller. I don't do this full time. I do all of the trades. I do all of the different trades. And what I need to do is I need to be basically good enough at every trade rather than perfect at any one particular trade. So I'm not gonna be learning every single thing that a master drywaller would spend 10 years learning. My job as a handyman is to do exactly what I need to do and exactly what I need to learn to be able to do an acceptable product on this. And this is an acceptable product. I do wanna point out for those of you who want to get much better at drywall, uh, go watch the Vancouver Carpenter. I think he is one of the best. Also that kilted guy. But I have definitely been watching a lot of the Vancouver Carpenter lately. And he's an expert. I can tell you that for sure. I watch this guy and I'm just like, man, I almost wish I'd have become a drywaller. Or actually, I don't know. What do you all call yourselves over there in that industry? What do you call yourself if you're if you do nothing but finishing drywall. So anyways, I'm putting a very thin coat on here as well, just like the last coat. And then once this coat's on, I'm gonna do the exact same thing you just saw me do before. I'm gonna let this coat sit for a while. And then after it sits five to 10 minutes, I'm gonna come do a very light scraping across it. Again, the whole purpose of this is so that we don't have to sand anything getting this in here nice and thin. And yes, I know for all y'all master drywallers out there, I look like I don't know what I'm doing 
because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not an expert at this. I do know that this works. I know I've done lots of them. I know I've put a lot of time into coming up with the right system that gets this done reliably and efficiently over time. I do go back to all of these properties I go to frequently because the companies that I do this work for, they have plenty of this work. So I'm always going back to the same properties doing move outs and whatnot after I've gone and done move outs a year ago and another move out a year before. I see my patches and they all look great guys. They all look good. So is this the best way? No, probably not. The Vancouver Carpenter can show you the best way. What I can show you is the way that is profitable, that gets the job done, that's predictable, that allows you to put together kits and allows you to be efficient without sacrificing the ultimate quality. Other than, again, like I said, guys like the Vancouver Carpenter, yes, he's going to be much higher, much higher quality than me. But rental house owners are not looking for the Lamborghini of drywall patches. They're looking for an affordable solution that gets the job done right away so they have happy tenants who keep paying rent. Okay, the first skim coat has set just long enough. It's still a little bit soft, but it's set. And we're gonna do the same thing. We're just gonna start at the end and very lightly, very gently at an extremely slight angle, we're just gonna take off the high spots. One more time. Now the next skim coat, we're not going to just simply scrape off the high spots. This is just to build us out until we're nice and sort of flush with the rest of the ceiling. Kind of reminds me of watching that, those Japanese carpenters when they use their, uh, oh, I'm brain farting on the name. What's the name of the tool that those Japanese carpenters use to take just thin little strips off of the wood? It's like the, the thickness of a piece of paper. I mean, I know it's a plane, um, but there's a name for that type of plane. They pull it instead of push it. It's very wide and they just take a sheet all the way down. And that's kind of what we're doing here. We're just taking a sheet all the way down of all the high spots. And this, again, this prevents us from having to do any sanding in here and get a whole bunch of just dust all over the house. So this one's scraped again. I'm pretty happy with how flat it is. I may, I may touch it up just a little bit more, but I think it looks all right. All right, and we're on the last round for skim coat. I've mixed this mud just a little bit thicker, not a whole lot. And what I'm going to try to do is just get most of it on quit pretty quick before it starts setting. Just get it touching the ceiling. And then I'm going to take a little bit of a wider knife and I'm going to come back and start flattening all of it out. But the goal, especially when you mix this mud with this hot mud anyways, with a little bit less water, one of your big goals is going to be to work fast if you're using five minute mud, because this is going to start setting up pretty quickly. And my only goal here, Right now, the only thing I'm trying to do is get the final skim coat on and get it all flattened out before it's too late to work it anymore. Let's add a tiny bit right there. Then we're gonna take our wider knife down here and I'm gonna start using this to actually flatten it and spread it. Let me see what I think of that. I do see a little bubble here. I'll be cutting that out, but that's the only bubble I see. I might 
could use just a little bit extra right in this area if we're not hardening up too fast already. Luckily, my drywall guy is about the best I've ever seen, so I have zero doubt that he's gonna be able to just do a really quick hot mud skim and then a texture on this for me. And, oh, one more. One more little pass. There we go. All right, guys, so I'm basically done with this at this point as far as the part I'm gonna do. After this, the next step would be some texture and then some primer and then some paint. What I'm gonna be doing with this particular one, and I won't put texture in a patch video anyways, because texture is its whole world. It's a whole different thing. I'm not great at it. I'm, I'm good enough at it for a standard spec home. However, if I was working on a much more expensive home, or if I was just working for somebody who really it was important to them that the texture is absolutely perfect, then typically what I do is I get it into this condition and then I'll send my drywall guy to actually come behind me and do the texturing. And then he can paint while he's there if he wants to, or I can send somebody else for the paint. But this basically wraps up this job. Uh, if we were in a spec home, again, I wouldn't put texture on this video. That's its own subject. But if I was in a regular spec home with texture that I could match, then all I'd do is I'd let this sit for a little while longer, same thing as before, come down and give it a very, very light scraping, and then I would apply the texture, let that texture sit and primer and paint. And let's go over a few notes on how this job went today. So first we'll talk about texture. As I mentioned on the video, I'm likely to send my drywall guy by to do the texture on this. However, I might go back and do it myself. This one did happen to be, it's kind of a hybrid between a Mediterranean and a Santa Fe. It's not really fully either one, and it has a lot of swirls in it. You'll find a lot of guys who do texture, they have their own style, and it doesn't match any category. It doesn't fall under any particular category, but it was closest to what I think I would call Mediterranean, which is relatively easy not to perfectly match, but it's relatively easy to put on with a minimal number of tools and a minimal number of time. Also, just for the record, Mediterranean and Santa Fe both are extremely forgiving. So what I mean by that is take a knockdown texture, for example. A knockdown texture is going to have a very specific pattern that's repeated everywhere, and it's really not going to vary much. Whereas with a Mediterranean and a Santa Fe, the point is almost to not be perfect, to have lots of imperfections, lots of ridges, lots of shadows. It looks different on most of the walls. One wall shouldn't look different from another wall, but this spot on a wall compared to this spot on a wall is not going to look exactly the same. And like I said, that's kind of the point with those. So it does make matching easier. Also, they're a little bit more forgiving. If you take a look at the skim coat, if I was doing a knockdown, I probably would have done one of two things, or my drywall guy would have done one of two things. If it was a, uh, a knockdown texture, your skim coat's gonna go out further and it's gonna feather a little more. You need a cleaner surface beneath that knockdown, and then you're gonna have to get the knockdown sprayed on there absolutely just right. As an alternative, more expensive alternative that your clients may or may not want, you can skim coat the entire wall and then do a fresh knockdown on the entire wall. And if it's not a perfect match with an adjacent wall, as long as it's close, that's usually not gonna stand out as much as an imperfect knockdown match on one wall where it's butted right up against the rest of that wall with a different knockdown texture. But had I had the time, unfortunately, I just had too much to do today, including getting this video. So had I had the time, I probably would have gone ahead and done a pretty decent job of duplicating that Mediterranean texture there, um, but I didn't, so I'll either go back tomorrow or I'll send my drywall guy. Uh, you might notice I did have a bubble in my tape I pointed out. It was a teeny tiny little bubble. It was only about an inch long and maybe an eighth of an inch wide, and by the time I was all set and done with everything, especially after doing my last little scrape at the end, it, you couldn't see it at all, and again, the Mediterranean texture is more forgiving, so I decided to go ahead and leave that. Now, if my drywall guy sees it and doesn't like it and doesn't want to texture over it, he can very quickly and easily take a razor knife and cut that little bubble out, 
and just put a little bit of mud in there and still do all of his texturing just the same. Or that's what I'll do when I go back if it does look like an issue. And then finally, at the very end of all this, when you're done, this isn't really part of the patch video. This will be part of a texture video. But when you're all done at the end, after it's textured, before you go to paint this, with hot mud or with regular joint compound, I do recommend putting a PVA primer on there. That way it, it's gonna help stop your, uh, your fresh paint from flashing and from soaking in. So PVA primer, that is something good to keep on hand for when you finish your texture and you go back to go ahead and paint that. Otherwise, I think the job went pretty smooth. It's not the best one I've done, not the worst one I've done. Just a standard job as far as time. I want to say, you know, there's a lot of time involved with setting up the camera and stuff, but what I just did wouldn't take me more than an hour to an hour and a half from the moment I walk in the door and lay my tarp down to the moment that I'm picking my tarp up, cleaning up the last little bits and heading out. Let's call it an hour and a half. And if I had textured, that would have taken approximately another 30 minutes. And then of course you got to wait for that to dry and then you can primer and paint, etc. Uh, but for what I did here today, I think I would probably be charging, let's say maybe 300 for that. You can charge more for sure because it's hard to find drywall guys who want to take those on. The great ones are, they're already working on production sites and the ones who aren't great don't really want to work on that stuff anyways. But I would probably charge about 300 for that portion had I textured it that would bump it up to about 400. And had I primed and painted it, which would take about another hour, maybe hour and a half of my time to get done correctly, that would add another 100 to $150. So all in all, I would say this patch, top of the line price for a handyman, especially here in Arizona with the limits we have, I can't charge more than a thousand. But for me, that's probably like $800 job, you know, anywhere between six and eight. It depends on who I'm doing it for. And one last thing, I almost forgot. I love you guys. I hope you're out there killing it and I will see you on the next one.